What does it mean when somebody says that the Bible is inerrant? 95% of the time, what it means is that they believe that the Bible consists of the actual words of God, that every word in the Bible was spoken by God to a writer who wrote it down precisely as given. And therefore, there are no errors in Scripture, whether we are speaking of um, science, ethics, morality, history, sociology, geopolitical movements, everything it has to say in there, every name, every date is correct, absolutely correct. And there's a group that, uh, and especially in Protestant circles, that has formed to defend this. It rises out of American fundamentalism back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, all the way up through to the present day. But its heyday was really up through the 60s, uh, 1960s. These people have even signed the Chicago Statement, which is a big uh, formal statement on their belief that the Bible has zero errors in it. And everything that it says is precisely accurate. There are, I've read so many books on this, and there are, there are literally thousands of YouTube videos, articles, journals, books, all of these written to defend inerrancy. One of these I read recently, well, a couple of years back now, is by Geisler and Roach, and it's called Defending Inerrancy. Because you see, the more people have access to the manuscripts and the more they have access to history, the more questions that are arising. And that really bothers people. And so they preemptively strike and get out ahead of it and say, if you don't understand it, or if it looks like it's a contradiction, it's not really, this is actually just you not understanding it. In fact, I was given a multi-volume set when I was a boy to read out of my dad's library and quizzed heavily after that was entitled Alleged Bible Contradictions Explained, and it was multi-volume. I did a page count and noticed that the pages were more than my Bible, and that bothered me somewhat, that we had to have a book larger than our Bible to explain away alleged contradictions in our Bible. But that's... That's neither here nor there. Page count is not a winning argument. Geisler in particular uh, goes after in the book, Defending Inerrancy, those who did not sign the Chicago Statement saying, we believe, yeah, absolutely. This would include Peter Enns, uh, Clark Pennick, Kenton uh, Sparks, Kevin Van Hooser, um, Andrew McGowan, uh, Stanley, Gren uh, Stanley Grins, Brian McLaren, Daryl Bach, um, there are others. And just going after them and saying something like, um, this is, these are just old rehashes of arguments that it were answered long ago. That's not an answer. What were the answers? Don't straw man this. Don't build up a straw man, knock it down and say you want a battle here. What were the arguments? How were they answered? Upon what basis, then, can we say this is settled? That is very rarely brought up in the book. In fact, that's kind of normal. People argue past each other, and therefore they don't tend to change their mind because they don't hear. Because what they hear, if they heard it, would make them change the way they did things, and they don't want to do that. So the Chicago Statement is made. People are held to it. Uh, the signers are looked upon as true teachers, those who won't sign it as false teachers. Here's a quote from the statement. Being holy and verbally God-given, Scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching, no less in what it states about God's acts in creation, about the events of world history, and about its own literary origins under God, than in its witness to God's saving grace in individual lives." End of quote. It's very thorough. It goes on to state that the Bible's words came directly from God and are therefore, quote, completely moral and without error in everything it affirms historically, scientifically, and theologically. End of quote. Uh, one of my brother believers who was raised up in the Restoration Movement named Tom Stark says this. The fact is, 
Fundamentalism as it exists in the Western world today is a relatively new phenomena, and there are many ways to be a Christian, some of them more ancient and developed. Because of the volume at which evangelicals tend to speak, however, this fact is well disguised from the view of many." End of quote. Were you aware that for millennia, people followed scripture to Jesus, believed in Christ, were baptized, lived their lives in service of Christ without believing the Bible was inerrant? And are you aware that many, many, many millions still do? I was not. I was, I would thought the only way to be a Christian was to accept the absolute perfection and righteousness of God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Bible. They were put up there as the same because the Bible was the work of God. I think the Bible is the work of God, but I believe it's the work of God through us, with us, and alongside of us. And I'm not in the minority in a Christian world, but I certainly am in the minority when it comes to the evangelical world. In fact, most evangelicals won't call me evangelical, and I'm not sure I want to be called that either. I just want to be a Christian. I just want to do what Jesus did. So, again, we could not put Ezra, Amos, and Hosea in the same room without them starting to beat each other up, because although they all loved God and all wanted to follow God, they had amazingly different ideas about what that meant and the way we treat foreigners, women, children, and our responsibilities. In fact, if we just read scripture, honestly, we're going to come across things that do not fit the doctrine of inerrancy. For example, in Ezra uh, chapter 10, verses two through 11, he says, Yahweh, Jehovah God, absolutely demands that it is a sin to marry a foreigner, and if you do, you must put them away, put them out of your house. Even if you had children with them, the children have to go. They're not of you, shove them out. But, but wait, Moses married a foreign woman, a Cushite. No, that is sometimes translated Ethiopian, but that doesn't really help us because the ancient word Ethiopia didn't mean just the Horn of Africa. I would say most likely that she was an African, but we need to understand that that word was widely used and strangely defined at the time. And wasn't the Canaanite prostitute Rahab in the line of Christ? What about Ruth, the Moabite? Wasn't she also in the line of Christ? Ezra would have been appalled had he read Matthew chapter one and all the begats and saw the names of the women, that would, have, that would have appalled him. And then second, if he'd known their story, he would have immediately disregarded Matthew as scripture. He would have said no, because to him, God was very plain. No foreign women ever allowed. So what are you gonna do with Ezra? How about um, Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 14 says marriage, intermarriage, uh, don't do that. And yet Numbers 31, not too long between there, not a big gap there, has God ordering the men of Israel to take wives of the foreign men they've killed. And I know it's, it's a horrible thing. It's so hard to even try to put this in context, we tried to the four part series on slavery and I still got all kinds of emails where they didn't hear anything I said because they had their mind made up. This um, was not good, it was not pleasant, it was not fair and it was not right in any way that you put it. That said, the women were not forced to go with these men. They were not forced to become brides. They were not raped, they were not misused they had they were the they were war widows because of Israel fighting these other people and god said you cannot leave these women unprotected so you have to offer them marriage but you don't approach them that meant don't physically demand anything of them sexually demand anything of them until they've gone through their period of mourning and if after they've gone through the period of mourning they decide to marry you then you cannot treat them any less than you do your native Israelite wives. 
And if they say no, you have to give them gifts and food and provision and send them on their way. Again, you can't make this pretty, but you could make it uglier, and God didn't. So we have that. But that's, even that, we've missed the point. Just Deuteronomy says, no, no, you cannot marry a foreigner. And then Numbers says, you have to. It's not a choice. You have to offer them. Ezra claimed he had the power to order these mass divorces because he had the backing of the Persian Empire. And he also claimed, and I have no doubt that he believed, that he had the backing of God. But other Jews opposed him, Ezra 10 and verse 15. They sounded more like God than Ezra did. But Ezra had political power, and so his side won. Pay attention to that pattern. Ezra 10, 15, there were people in Ezra's day who were followers of God, who disagreed with Ezra, but they did not have the Persian government backing them, therefore they lost. Sometimes it's not who is true who wins, it's who has the backing of power. American fundamentalism learned that message and still works within that message today. Then Amos comes along and condemns Israel for putting more stock in their genes than in their justice, as one writer put it. And he told them if they continued to ignore uh, justice in the land and for caring for the poor, that they are no different than any other nation. And God agrees with that. In chapter 9, verse 7 of Amos, saying that they're no different than the Ethiopians. Again, a very broad thing, all of Northern Africa down to Central Africa, and in some cases, all the way over to Syria and Iraq and Iran. So we don't know where Ethiopia was located. That's not the point. I just chased another rabbit, sorry. Jesus would tell the story of the Good Samaritan. He would heal the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. He would uh, align himself with Amos and against a Jonah or an Ezra. But how can this be? If every word from Ezra came directly from the mouth of God, how can this be? Because Jesus is the exact representation of God, according to Hebrews, and I certainly believe that. Then how do we deal with this? Jonah was firmly in the camp of Ezra, Joshua, and Zerubbabel, but God makes sure that we know he's in the camp of Amos and Jesus. Notice how stark a difference ex exists between the two camps. Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 through 19. God says, you've got to go in there and you've got to kill every man, every woman, and every child. Can you imagine Jesus giving that order? I'm not talking about the Jesus that's been co-opted by religion. I'm talking about the Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yes, I'm very well aware that crusades were led. People, in the name of Jesus, kill all the babies. I'm aware people did that. But can you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and get that out of the mouth of Jesus at all? No, you can't. You, you, you can't. Deuteronomy 20, 16 through 19, not only says you have to kill all the men, the women, and the children. It says, but, you know, don't hurt the trees. It says that. So ask yourself, how can, how can Jesus order people to kill all the people, even the babies, but I really like the trees, leave them alone. Well, I know many people believe they can make such a point and they'll say, well, you see, the people there had, had devolved so badly into paganism and sacrifice and evil. Got it, I understand that, but why do we kill the babies? And oh my goodness, I've seen them tie themselves up in knots trying to make this righteous, good, and ethical. Let me just stress something here as I bring this to a close for a Monday morning, because we try not to go too long. I don't really view these as contradictions. I, review, I, I see these as arguments and developments as God introduces himself to us, it must be done so in a way that we can understand. Therefore, like an onion, many, many, many layers. 
there's no way God's going to talk to Moses about quantum physics and how you know, bangs blew up into movements and it, it all became this um, you know, wonderful universe we are. No, Moses isn't going to get that. And in Leviticus chapter 11, when he's trying to show them, eat these foods because these are safe for you. These foods are not safe for you for a variety of reasons. Um, and he says, you know, the rabbit, though it chews the could, doesn't have the... Well, rabbits don't chew a could. That's, that's scientifically wrong. However, is it wrong in the sense that it was a problem? No, no. It's very useful. God knew these people did not have the science to go around and dissect everything, check it under microscopes, check the alimentary canal. He knew they didn't have that, so he's giving them externals to look for. And a rabbit sure looks like it's chewing a good, but it isn't. But who cares? God wanted it to be useful. And sometimes useful is not scientifically accurate. You just go useful. I know that there's some scientists out there that start going like this right now. I'm a scientist too. Think about it. We all know that there are ways to explain things so that it becomes useful to people. That we don't, we, we know that they're scientifically not pristine. But if we tried to tell them, it'd fry circuits, because that's not what they do. God knows that too. So he works with us. He unrolls us. It's not just Jacob that has to wrestle God. We all do. That's why my faith is not rocked when somebody points out that almost no scholar believes Peter wrote 2 Peter or that uh, the book of Revelation almost didn't make it into the Bible. I mean, it was, a, it was a couple hundred years touch and go there. Or that Moses may not have written the books of Moses or certainly not all the books of Moses. That doesn't bother me at all because I see this as a development to bring us to Christ, our teacher, our Lord, and our Savior. So we'll pick it up from next Monday as we continue to take a look at what is this book we have? What do we do with it? God bless you. Have an amazing week.